And welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged. This is sort of the lean back version of what I do on the Bible Answer Man broadcast out of the studio into the study, talking to some of the most significant people on the planet. And today is no exception. I'm talking to Mary Eberstadt. She's an American essayist. She's a novelist. She's the author of many books. We'll probably talk about some of those books today. And she has an incredible gift with the pen. Her writing has appeared in magazines, including Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, National Review, The Weekly Standard, and I could go on and on. And then in March 2017, Mary was named Senior Research Fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, D.C., And Mary has been on our broadcast a number of times because I was so excited about one of her books. I'm excited about all of her books, but a book titled It's Dangerous to Believe, Religious Freedom and Its Enemies. Yeah, we'll talk about that some today as well. But we want to talk about what's happening. There's a great paradigm shift taking place in Western civilization, and we have to wake up to its realities. There's a brand new orthodoxy afoot. And interestingly enough, we have sort of an unholy alliance between a liberal liberalism and illicit Islam. Again, we'll talk about all of that and more on today's edition of Hank Unplugged. You can help This space, we're in a particular religious space, and we've reached number six in this space. You can help us reach number one by letting other people know about Hank Unplugged, sharing, reviewing, rating, and letting as many people know about Hank Unplugged as humanly possible. Mary, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Hank. It's great to be talking to you again. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You're one of my favorite guests on the Bible Answer Man broadcast. I think the work that you did, and it's dangerous to believe, is one of the great contributions to Western civilization. That's a big platitude. But what I mean by that is you're opening people's eyes to two things, I think. One is something that's squarely in the blind spot of the West, and that is the mass genocide of Christians in the East. And then there's a change, as it were, taking place in Western civilization where Christian ideologies are being replaced by a new kind of fanatical religious ideology. It's not as though we're going to materialism or secularism at its base, but we're going to a new ideology that has a lot to do with the sexual revolution. Yes, absolutely, Hank. There's so much going on out there, but I think what's really new and unexpected is this development of what I call a secularist religion. Now, we have seen secularist religions or secular ideologies that operate like religion before. We saw this most notably in the case of communism. Uh, which eventually fell, at least as an idea that could claim the loyalties of millions of people. Of course, it's still in force in some places, but it doesn't have that that sort of quasi-religious claim to people's loyalty. Well, what we're seeing now, and I think completely unexpected, but for the past 50 years, since the invention of the birth control pill specifically, which gave rise to the sexual revolution, We are seeing a secularist religion that is developing and more sophisticated year by year that is grounded in theology about the sexual revolution. Now, I don't think religious believers saw this coming. I think we're all acquainted with the kind of ferocity and prejudice that Christian expression can um, be greeted with in the public square these days. I think We can think of many examples. We can get into some of them if you like. But as to where this hostility is coming from, I think we have to understand this new rival faith to Christianity. The people who believe that the sexual revolution is paramount 
and that sexual expression is the most morally ex- uh, protected form of expression, are absolutists about their beliefs. And their beliefs are, of course, diametrically opposed to what conventional, traditional Christian teaching is and always has been. So that's the conflict. That's what's at the root of the conflict that we see in these Supreme Court cases about religious expression. That's what's at the root of not wanting, say, a football coach to drop to his knees at the end of a game. Um, In case after case, we're seeing the sort of bubbles on the surface, and I don't mean to make light of that, of a much deeper conflict, and it's a conflict between people who believe in the good book that is traditional Judeo-Christianity and people who believe in the figurative book that's being written about belief in the sexual revolution. So if you believe in this figurative book, there are some maxims, and those maxims include if you are against abortion, you are therefore anti-female. If you oppose same-sex marriage, therefore you hate people attracted to same sex. If you are against gender fluidity, then you are against those who want that open freedom of expression. So this kind of puts Christians in a box. Once you turn the tables in this way, and if people do not understand that this is illogical, they immediately think, well, anti-abortion? Well, no wonder, you're a bigot. And then there comes this great tidal wave of having to unseat Christianity because it is the main force for evil in Western civilization. So it's no longer seen as that which gave rise to jurisprudence, that which gave rise to science, that which gave rise to the arts, etc., but it's seen as that which is the ultimate enemy. In fact, an enemy that is far greater than Islam, because Islam is seen, by contrast, to be a religion of peace and tolerance. Yes, When I say that there is a secularist religion that's developed in the Western world, certainly I'm not saying that it's always logically consistent. I think those examples that you gave are spot on. So, for instance, let's talk for a minute about abortion. Pro-life advocates get smeared routinely with this label of being anti-woman. It's ridiculous. If you look at the debate, who is really standing for women here? In the case of abortion, we have something going on called gender side, and it's happening around the world. Girl fetuses are aborted at much higher rates than male fetuses, especially in societies that prize, uh, you know, depend on having a son. So who is standing up for women? Is it the, the people who are saying, Uh, the more abortion, the better? Or is it the people who are saying there is something immoral going on here? And that's just one example of the sort of illogic. You pointed out some other very good ones um, that riddles this secularist religion. Of course, it's not true that in virtue of opposing same-sex marriage, um, Christians oppose people with various erotic leanings one way or the other. Of course, it's not true that they're haters. But these very harmful words, hater and bigot, have been introduced by believers in the new secularist faith in order to shut down Christian argument. People don't want to have a discussion about these things if they are uh, adherents of the Church of the Sexual Revolution. I think they know that 2,000 years of Christian thinking has probably given people some pretty good arguments on the Christian side, and they don't want to deal with that. And that's where these labels are coming from. They are used to stop debate and stop discussion in what the other side fears would be a losing uh, conversation for them. You sort of mentioned the moniker thinking. I mean, perhaps that's the problem. I mean, people aren't thinking anymore. I mean, we're being bombarded with advertisement. We see incredible chaos around the world, and then we go to an advertisement. We never really think, and I think so often that's the problem. If you look at what's going on in uh, the campus craziness around the world, you have people who don't think, they don't actually engage the arguments. They simply have a particular bias. They fly with the bias instead of 
uh, having an interchange of ideas or real dialogue. Yeah, and I'm sure it's always human nature, Hank, to want to take the easy way out. We also have to keep in mind that, of course, the Internet inflames everything and everybody. But that said, what there's very little awareness of these days is the harm that's being inflicted on fellow citizens, fellow neighbors, fellow family members by these labels of hater and bigot, where often all that is meant is that you follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. And this is really something new in American history. Um, One way I think of it is that we used to be a society that feared God, and now we are a society where people jeer God and feel morally purposeful when they do that. So this is a real civilizational change. We have to be aware of it, I think, Um, and we have to understand that what Christians today are up against in the Western world um, is not just some polite disagreement with people who have moved past Christianity. No, what they're up against is a real mortal struggle with the theology of the sexual revolution, because people who believe in that theology think and understand that Christianity is the biggest living threat. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about this a little bit, because in many ways, Christians are going to be the people that have to pick up the pieces in the end. Uh, Transgenderism, uh, a classic case in point. You have a particular narrative that is being communicated in classrooms. I mean, talking about kids that are six, seven, eight years old who are being told that perhaps they're a girl trapped in a boy's body or a boy trapped in a girl's body. And therefore, they really don't know what their gender identity is. They'll probably find that out later on. Or sometimes they're told, you know, if you feel like uh, you're a girl trapped in a boy's body, you ought to be taking some kind of drug. You ought to start looking into doing something about the body that you have. And then that body... At a very early age, and there's some chilling examples of this, uh, starts to be tampered with, and even though you can tamper with it in an artificial, superficial way, ultimately, you can't change biology on a cellular level. So all of that is simply to say, Mary, I mean, I think what's going on here is we're sowing to the wind, we're going to reap the whirlwind, and if, in fact... Christians understand what's going on, we can be there to pick up the pieces because the social experiment, I think, is devastating for people created in the Imago Dei, the image and likeness of God. Absolutely, Hank. And this is another side of the whole discussion that people aren't grasping. That is that in any other context, if what we're being defended were not somehow the sexual revolution, the idea that we are all sexually malleable in all dimensions, and that we get to call the shots about what we do with our bodies. If it were about anything but that, and I were to say to you, Hank, I've just found out that there are medical experiments being run on children, uh, you know, in a very um, untoward way, giving them drugs, changing basic things about them, surgery, which some people would call mutilation. If I were to say those things, In any other context but the sexual revolution, people would say, that's terrible. We can't have that. But somehow when it comes to the terrible human fallout of the revolution, people who want to defend it at all costs are blind to the damage that's being done out there. And I think part of our jobs as people who do not believe that theology Uh, is to bring that damage to the attention of people even understanding that they have deep reasons for not wanting to see the damage. I'll give you another example. In the name of the sexual revolution and its growing theology, there is more and more commercial surrogacy, you know, meaning people who hire themselves out very often in the third world and are paid, um very often by couples, um, for reasons of the sexual revolution, to have children. 
Now, this is another experiment that is probably not going to look so good in the rearview mirror of history. And there's a lot more out there that social science has documented. Of course, we know about the damages to kids uh, from broken homes. And in saying that, I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I mean, Christians are always accused of doing that. That's not the case. But we all know the kinds of educational outcomes, behavioral outcomes, et cetera, uh, and the risks that are raised in particularly homes without a dad. So there is a lot that has happened on account of the sexual revolution that is not to the credit of the revolution. And it should be fair game to insist on pointing that out. You know, I want to get into a few more of these issues, but just thinking extemporaneously here, I mean, you're one of the brightest people on the planet, in my view. I mean, I just love to read what you write. I love the gift that God has given you. But you had to go through some kind of metamorphosis. I mean, were you always on the track that you're on right now, or how did you get on this track? Oh, well, that's an unexpected question, but I guess that's what we get for being unplugged, right? That's exactly Um, right. We're going to call it unhinged at one time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was partly just from using the evidence of my senses, Hank. And, you know, in the long run, I'm an optimist about all these things. I'd say a short-run pessimist and a long-run optimist. Why? Because there's now so much damage out there that people are looking for alternatives to the way that many modern people live now. They're looking for alternatives to the hookup culture, to drugs and alcohol abuse, etc. All these things that are prevalent on especially secular campuses these days, and which I saw on my secular campus, like many other uh, people, Everyone is looking, or not every, unfortunately not everyone, but a lot of people are looking for some kind of way out from all that. And so paradoxically, I think what we're seeing out there is as the hostility rises to traditional Christian expression, we are also seeing the growth, including on campuses, of various Christian groups, tradition-minded groups, and other small platoons that are trying to stand in contradiction to the larger trends out there. And so that's a roundabout way of saying it was partly by finding those little platoons, in my case, finding people who felt like they were refugees from all this, um, that got me thinking that this was something that should be studied and put into writing. Yeah, you know, one of the things, and I think you've put this into writing as well, I mean, you think about same-sex sexuality, this is not just a Christian issue. I mean, if you look at the sociological metrics, they point uniformly to the fact that gender-differentiated parenting is best for children. So if you really care about the welfare of children, you wouldn't be on this mad rush towards redefining the nuclear family, or disrupting the nuclear family. I mean, this is one of the core values of Black Lives Matter. I mean, you look on their website, and that's exactly what they say. They use the moniker, disrupting the nuclear family. And this seems to me to be where the real hate speech lies. Well, yes, this is another thing um, that, for some reason, hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves. When we talk about... Uh, how parents are entitled to children somehow, you know, as if it's a something in the Bill of Rights. What people tend not to talk about is what children are entitled to or are arguably entitled to. It's always that the adult, quote, wants the child and has a right to the child. But what about the children in these situations? What I see is that there are people in this world who will purposely um, take away from a child the right to a mother or the right to a father. In other words, there are people who will purposely deprive a child of either a mother or a father, say, in in the case of same-sex marriage. Um, Why do we think that's okay? Who wants to look that 12-year-old in the eyes down the road and explain why you don't have a mommy? 
this is an example of where if we really get on the ground of these cases, we see heartbreaking things that don't show up in discussions by, you know, well-heeled, well-funded groups that are engaged in legal battles over these things. But if we look at these things through the eyes of the children who are being affected by them, then I think we can't help but be moved in a direction to say, this is wrong. Yeah, if you look at this whole idea of a secularist religion, there are high priests that come to mind. I mean, you think about Gloria Steinem or Margaret Mead, certainly Margaret Sanger. And I want to single her out for a moment because here was a person who was very much on the vanguard of the eugenics movement. And today we have a new hyper-eugenics movement afoot. I was reading a couple of months ago about what's going on in Iceland where they're saying they're now almost 100% down syndrome baby free. They've almost eradicated Down syndrome babies through abortion and the like. And that's supposed to be a great thing. That's being lauded as a step forward. In fact, Richard Dawkins, probably the most influential materialist on the planet today, says that it is quite frankly immoral to bring a Down syndrome child into the world. So we have this new move towards a hyper-eugenics that eradicates those that are thought to be unfit in society, and in their place, we're looking towards designer babies. Yeah, it's a great point, Hank. And there is an implicit cruelty to say nothing of a um, lack of diversity in one's outlook um, that would wipe children like that from the face of the earth. I'm so glad you brought up Margaret Sanger. We live in a moment where there are uh, upset, agitated groups that want to pull down statues of Confederates, and they are making their argument in the public square, and I'm glad that they are. They aren't just making emotive appeals. They're, They're making an argument about how things have changed, and how we have developed morally as a people. So whatever you think of their case, it is astonishing to me that Margaret Sanger hasn't been torn down from her podiums all over America. As a matter of fact, consider this. Planned Parenthood, for years and years, gave annual awards. I think the last ones were in 2015 called the Maggies, and they were named for Margaret Sanger, to journalists who had written pro-choice pieces, etc., um, and to other figures who had somehow come into the, quote, pro-choice fold. All right, let's look at that for a minute. Margaret Sanger was unflinching in her insistence on the inferiority of certain other people, Uh, She wanted to keep down the numbers of certain other people. She believed very much that there were fit people and unfit people. And guess what? Fit people looked like her, and unfit people looked like, well, fill in the blank. So it's very hard to understand why Margaret Sanger gets a pass in a moment of um, extra attention to racism and extra moral sensitivity to racism in America's past, when she was the embodiment of this kind of eugenic thinking. So again, what we're seeing is that in any other context, besides defending the sexual revolution, no one would be getting away with this, but Margaret Sanger's getting away with it because uh, she is a paragon of the revolution. She is the equivalent of a secular saint. I think people who stand against what she stood for should be proud of themselves. And um, I think that those of us who do are on the right side. You know, what's really interesting about this is uh, I've looked into this a little bit over the years, and you look at this being a huge, huge issue in the United States of America. I mean, you talk about a really virulent evil in America, and there have been many, but this seems to me to be at the top of the list. And the odd thing about it is that this was considered progressive before World War II. 
in universities like Stanford and Princeton and Harvard, this was considered very, very progressive. Uh, legislation was passed, pro-eugenics legislation, passed in blue states ranging from California to New York. You had prestigious people. It wasn't just Margaret Sanger on this bandwagon, but they had bought into an ideology that said that the unfit were affecting the gene pool such that the fit did not survive as well. And so the only thing we could do is make sure that we got rid of those that were unfit. And as you've correctly said, the unfit were oftentimes people that did not look like the stereotypical America. There were blacks oftentimes, there were Jews, there were people who had some kind of a physical malady. But this was something that was orthodoxy within America, and it really didn't see its demise for a while at least until it reached full bloom in the genocidal German death camps. And then it sort of vanished into the night, and no one wants to say that they had any association with this eugenic movements. We're sort of quietly paying reparations for the harm that we did to blacks. I mean, we're doing that in North Carolina, for example. But most people don't want to own up to the fact that this was an ideology that was uncritically bought into that devastated lives, and we're now seeing history repeat itself in other places. Yes, and once again, Christianity should get some credit for being on the right side of that issue. It's Christianity infused with Judaism, that taught humanity that all human beings are equal in the sight of God. That's a revolutionary idea. Christianity, correctly applied, should get some credit for that insight. Eugenics wasn't some kind of Christian thing. It was a progressive thing, as you correctly point out. And when progressives today wonder why there are people who are, you know, standing, quote, on the wrong side of history. It's because we don't want to be standing wherever they are, certainly not in the case of eugenics. Similarly, Hank, I think Christianity gets such a bad rap for being bad on women somehow. It was Christianity that introduced the very idea that men and women were morally equal, so morally equal that consent was required for marriage. This is a very early Christian idea, and again, it's revolutionary. Now, were there equal outcomes? No, of course not. Were there you know, equal economic uh, statuses throughout history? No. But the idea that a woman's soul was just as important as a man's and that it would be jeopardized if she couldn't freely consent to marriage or that the marriage would be invalid without both parties freely willing it, that's a fantastic, liberating idea. It's one of the most liberating ideas ever to appear in humanity. And again, that's a Christian idea. So part of what I'm trying to say is that I think for reasons we all understand, a lot of traditional believers have been in a defensive crouch, right? Because they weren't expecting how ferocious the winds against them would become, they weren't expecting all of these religious liberty cases suddenly proliferating across the land. Uh, they weren't expecting that they wouldn't be able to practice their faith without public ostracism. But the defensive crouch is not the answer when what you're in possession of are truths that other people are losing sight of, that have been a boon to humanity. So be proud of standing on the right side of the eugenics discussion, for example. Be proud of standing against what Margaret Sanger and all the other people like her stood for. I think we can, without patting ourselves on the back, we can be emboldened to know some of the good that Christianity has done out there in the world. Yeah, you know, I think in some way, Mary, though, Christians are shooting themselves in the foot in our culture I mean, you have many Christians that are saying that the universe is 6,000 years old. You have Christians, or at least pseudo-Christians, holding up signs saying, God hates fags. And you also 
have Christians today predicting the end of the world based on a misreading of biblical passages. In other words, they don't know how to read the Bible in the sense in which it's intended. In fact, they don't even know how to read the literature in the sense in which it's intended. But even beyond that, I think that there's another side of the coin with respect to the Christian church, which is that we're buying into a cultural narrative uncritically. So many of the things that you're talking about, that you're bringing to the fore, just about the time you're bringing it to the fore, many Christians are already capitulating. So you hear all these slogans, gay or straight here, there's no hate here, for example, as though um, uh, the, the it, it, it again is this false dichotomy that somehow or other this whole equation involves hating gays. And so the cultural narrative has seeped into the church. So you have a fundamentalism on the left and a fundamentalism on the right, both of which I think are not palatable with the kinds of maxims or the kind of paradigm shift that you're looking to affect in this world. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more, Hank. Essentially what's happening is that we have these two religions, the religion of the sexual revolution and the religion of Christianity. And you are quite right. In the face of this kind of hostility we see now, a lot of Christians are preemptively capitulating. They won't put it that way, but they are censoring themselves. And in effect, what they're saying is, well, I'm going to carry my Christian passport for some purposes, and then I've got this other passport to the sexual revolution that I'm going to use for other purposes so that nobody gets mad at me. And, you know, that's the kind of incoherence out of which comes these ideas of, well, yes, I'm a Christian, but I think the churches are wrong about X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z always have to do with the sexual revolution, right? Nobody says the church is wrong to teach against stealing, um, you know, It is always coming down to uh, traditional Judeo-Christian morality about sex. So a lot of people are trying to have it both ways. And I think uh, part of the decline of Christianity that is documented in surveys, the decline that's documented particularly among the young, is coming partly from this place that is not like from a philosophical rethinking by a great many people who then wake up and say, oh, that Christian thing is all, you know, very yesterday, and we don't need it, we don't believe it, we've showed all the logical problems with it. No. Where the fall-off in attendance and practice is coming from, in part, is that people are afraid. They value the opinions of their secular neighbors, they want their kids to get into uh, the kinds of, say, private schools and colleges and other sorts of rarefied environments where their opinions won't be a problem for them. And, you know, it goes on and on, but I think a lot of people are censoring themselves preemptively so that they can fit better um, and in a less, you know, with less friction into this secular society where increasingly the religion that is influential is the religion of the sexual revolution. Yeah, so I want to turn a little bit of a corner, although this is sort of on the same topic. I just wrote a book called Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. It's a HarperCollins imprint. It's coming out officially October 10th, although the books are available to our constituency right now. The thing that's interesting about this is that I've started talking a little bit about this on the radio. And immediately, some of our Canadian affiliates have had trouble because the Canadian Parliament has passed an anti-Islamophobia motion, and now everything's being examined. In other words, they've got to hold back our show, play a tape show, because the idea is I may say something that is Islamophobic. And I want to talk about that for a moment because it seems to me that when you have an imprint like HarperCollins, you know, obviously they weren't going to publish a book unless it was bulletproof. And, you know, I've been known for my fastidious research, so I don't come off half-cocked. And essentially what I'm saying in that book, I mean, there's a lot I'm saying in the book, but one of the things I say in the book is that there are millions and millions of peace-loving Muslims. And I actually start the book out with an example of me being 
in Iran, walking the streets of Iran in the middle of the night as I'm speaking at the University of Toronto, I mean, I got jet lag, and then at night I'm walking the streets of Toronto. I met with nothing but acts of kindness. So I've seen peace-loving Muslims. I've had a Muslim live in my home for a year. So I can attest to the fact that there are millions and millions of peace-loving Muslims. But on the other hand, the point that I'm making, and this is where the Islamophobia comes in, at least in perception, is that Islam, by its very DNA, is not a religion of peace and tolerance. That's just a historical fact borne out over 1,400 years of human history. But now, just saying that, going against the cultural narrative, and the narrative, I suppose, has inculcated in it the idea that if you say Islam is not a religion of peace and tolerance, then you're exacerbating hostilities that might otherwise lay dormant. So now in Canada, uh, I'm being censored, as it were, because anything that goes against the cultural narrative is now considered hate speech. It is a very interesting question, Hank, exactly what you're raising about the relationship between the kind of anti-Christian hostility that we see and the anxiety over radical Islam that has been felt by most people in the Western world since 9-11, and I think increasingly with um, what's happening in Europe right now. Some years ago, I wrote an essay called The Scapegoats Among Us, and it made the case that part of where this uh, particularly belligerent anti-Christianity is coming from is that there is this free-floating desire to do something about religion, but only about the religion it's safe to attack. (laughs) So, in other words, look, everybody knows that you can put um, a musical on Broadway called The Book of Mormon, which is a musical that makes fun of um, Mormon theology and Mormons. But you wouldn't dare fill in the blank there with with certain other labels, let's say. So part of what's happening is, why are we seeing all of this anti-Christianity? Why are are school kids, to, to give an example from my book, like why were school kids in a couple of elementary schools Uh, kept from putting toys in little shoeboxes and sending them to kids, you know, poor kids in the third world. Uh, Well, the reason is that Christianity is safe to attack. The safe in the sense that no one's going to um, fear for their personal security by Christian bashing in the public square. Um, It's safe to do that all over, as we can see just by turning on the television. So there is a dynamic afoot here, I think. Uh, where the less penalty there is to doing this, the more we're going to see of it, because Christianity is perceived as the religion that will roll over um, and let this happen. I think even more, if I might say this, it seems to me that since Christianity is the dominant worldview in the West, the West was shaped by a Christian worldview, we're living sort of no longer in the pages of the biblical worldview, but in its aftermath. But I think the very fact that Western civilization is rooted and grounded here means that you have many, many people who are thinking that we have to uproot Christianity as the dominant social, spiritual force in the West. And Islam seems to be viewed exactly the opposite. It's a religion of peace and tolerance, and therefore, in some naive way, to fill the vacuum with Islam doesn't seem onerous to secularists, to materialists, for this new faith that you're talking about, this new secularist ideology. And I think therein lies a naivete that could be, well, could see the very same thing happening here in America that's now starting to happen in many of the EU nations, not the most eastern ones like Poland and so forth that still respect their borders, but many of the EU nations like Switzerland or Sweden or Holland or 
England, uh, well, you could name the list. The problem here that I'm getting you to comment on is just this idea of a dominant secularism which declares Christianity to be the worst of all religions and sort of naively welcomes Muslims as the best of our neighbors. Yes, and it is really interesting in Europe right now uh, to try and address this a, a bit. I mean, what we're seeing there is that you remember there was a big argument about whether the role of Christianity in European history should even be mentioned in the EU founding documents. And mostly Christians lost that one. So there has been this determined drive to get rid of anything that smacks about Christianity, you know, not only in in France, which has always had laicite, but uh, in other countries as well. Now, I think one thing we've learned is that The new atheists were wrong to frame the discussion as there are people who believe and people who don't believe. Instead, everybody believes in something. The question is what? So to take it back to Europe, what we're seeing is that the ideology, the religion, the quasi-religion of the sexual revolution is what Europe has left, because most of the continent jettisoned purposely the Christian heritage. So when you're talking about immigrants um, acculturating to the countries of Europe these days, you're not talking about them learning Christianity. You're talking about them learning the quasi-religion of the sexual revolution, which is the one thing that the countries of Western Europe now agree upon. You gave the example of Iceland, you know, getting rid of kids with Down syndrome. Um, Europe is ahead of us. Uh, Its theology of the sexual revolution is more developed than ours, but you're right. It's where we're pointing if we uh, aren't careful. But the point is this. Faced with the choice, well, do you choose your religion or do you choose the religion of the sexual revolution? The answer of the immigrants in Europe now, is not to choose the religion of the sexual revolution. So as a competitor to traditional faith, it looks as if it doesn't hold up very well when it comes to commanding the loyalties of people who are actually in possession of a strong faith. Let's talk for a moment about what is going on in the EU countries where you have self-aborting Europeans They're self-aborting through, well, abortion, euthanasia, same-sex sexuality, gender fluidity, transsexualism, and the like. So you got a demographic issue here. The demographics are that the death rate far exceeds the birth rate, and therefore the native populations are dying out. That vacuum has to be filled, and now it's being filled with a rush of polygamous Muslims that have no sense whatsoever that they ought to assimilate into Western civilization. They have their own Sharia law, Sharia state, state is Sharia, and and therefore they have their own way of doing things, and the demographic problem becomes a critical political problem once you have this critical mass. Once a country becomes Islamic demographically, it will inevitably succumb to Islam politically as well. And so a huge, huge problem, and I think it's a problem to some degree that we're staving off in America, but it's a problem that because of naive thinking, we may be facing in a far more virulent way as well. Well, the question is, what did people think was going to happen when that vacuum was created? In other words, This demographic problem was building even before mass immigration. Europeans stopped having children, um, as you point out. And among other things, this has created an ongoing crisis of the welfare states of Western Europe because they were not premised on the idea that everything would rest on the back of a handful of young taxpayers. They were premised on the idea that there would be a lot more uh, income from taxes. So even if we look strictly at the economics and leave uh, everything else out of it, this demographic um, shortfall or problem or crisis 
has been building for quite a while. But I think the fundamental question, Hank, is what did people think was going to happen? The anomaly that is Western Europe and parts of the United States today is the creation of a civilization that seems to disdain humanity itself, that uh, wants to reduce the often spoken of human footprint on the world, uh, that chooses not to reproduce itself. We've never seen a civilization like this. It's no wonder that nobody knows quite what to do about it. Uh, but I think we do have to understand, again, when Christianity says, look, we don't believe in going around um, telling other people uh, how many children they should have, for example. Uh, we don't believe in getting rid of the so-called unfit or aborting in aborting baby girls because they're less convenient to their families. We don't believe in those things that are now uh, kind of at the heart of the shared civilization of much of Western Europe. And I think it's a good thing that we don't believe in those things. And I think we should be working on our neighbors and our families and our friends and anyone who will listen to us to say, look, if you want to be on the right side of things, you should be on this side of these things. You know what's interesting to me? I've often wondered about this with you. I mean, you're getting published by some of the premier outlets in the world, and certainly in America. I mean, you just talk about the Wall Street Journal or whatever. And I think, and this is my theory, I think that because of the excellence of your work, you still get published. And I think there's a message there for other people, which is to say, if Christians actually think if they write in a compelling way, there's still a market for the ideas that they're communicating. And I think you're exhibiting on that. Well, thank you, Hank. That's very kind. Um, I can tell you this. There is no faster way to success and respect uh, in public than to recant <laughs> certain teachings of the Bible. And we see this over and over again. I think that social fact is part of what's driving the fall-off in practice and belief. It's not that people are having massive, you know, theological problems with this question or that question. No, it's that they want the good opinion of their neighbors. And I think the way to keep that sort of apprehension from being crippling, you know, to stiffen the backbones of the believers is to point out over and over, look, we're on the right side of this one. We're on the right side of that one. Don't let progressive rhetoric about being on the right side of history fool you. I think, you know, there's something deeply ironic about their appropriation of that phrase, because in case after case, if you just look with a little dispassion, um, at what the sexual revolution is creating out there, you can see that Christianity has been right to stand as a sign of contradiction to all that. Let's talk for a moment about this whole idea of dimnitude. I mean, you have in many Muslim countries, Christians and Jews and others being dimmies. They have to pay a jizya, a poll tax, that's sort of a gangster protection racket to be able to live in some modicum of freedom. Uh, but the payback is that you have to be very, very meek about your expression of whatever faith you have. If it's Judaism or Christianity, I mean, you don't want to carry around a Torah or a Bible in public, or you don't want to uh, ring your bell too loud as to attract any attention. But that same thing, and I think you've made the point somewhere, that same thing is happening now in America. There's the dimnitude of American Christians where you're allowed to exist within the culture as long as you're quiet, you don't ring the church bell, you don't memorize scripture, and above all, if you're going to talk in a secular medium, you don't bring up your Christian faith, because there's this idea that, I mean, I forget who it was, but someone was talking recently about this, saying, you know, my problem with you having this particular position is that you're wearing your Christianity on your sleeve. It wasn't exactly in those words. Mm -hmm. I think it was Feinstein that said that. I 
mm-hmm. as I recall. But that seems to be the dimnitude idea. You can exist and you can survive in this new, well, what you would say, substitute theology. You can survive with this new substitute theology as a Christian as long as you don't make any noise, as long as you're a dimmy. Well, of course, we're not talking about suffering the physical consequences of, say, you know, the genocide of the Christians in the Middle East, but we are talking about something important here, which is what Pope Francis called the polite persecution, which is not always so polite these days, um, of religious believers in Western countries. And the examples you point out of these high-profile confirmation hearings recently, where, you know, a candidate's Catholicism became the object of attack, um, where she was asked, are you an Orthodox Catholic? As if anyone would ever dare ask, are you an Orthodox anything else? Um, I, part of what's so distressing about these cases is that we have a First Amendment in this country. You know, one of the first religious liberty cases I remember was from Great Britain. Some years ago, a street preacher was arrested for reading the Bible aloud on the street. This is a real case. And he wasn't in any section. He was reading part of the book of Leviticus aloud on the street. And it was interpreted as hate speech. And he was hauled off to jail um, and eventually got out. Well, Hank, my point is, they don't have a First Amendment. We have a First Amendment that is supposed to protect candidates, uh, whether for political office or otherwise, from being attacked for their religious faith. And what we're seeing instead is a combination of what I've been trying to describe, which is self-censorship, And then in cases where people refuse to self-censor, we have uh, social opprobrium, we have social penalties. Um, There have been people who have lost their jobs. There are cases detailed in the book about this. Um, And this is, I think, obviously a very worrisome uh, manifestation of this civilizational change. I have been wearing for some time a pin on my lapel when I wear a jacket, which is kind of seldom. But sometimes I wear it on my golf shirt or whatever. But that pin essentially has the 14th letter of the Arabic alphabet on it, pronounced noon. And it's a symbol of derision in the Middle East by Muslims, certainly by ISIS. But for me, it's a, it's a symbol of solidarity with Christians who are facing mass genocide in the Middle East. But you point something out that I thought was kind of interesting. I thought maybe I ought to be wearing two pins. You point out in one of your books that C is the new scarlet letter representing Christians. So on the one hand, you have this idea of the Nazarene, the noon, being, you know, scrawled out on houses and places of worship, a term of derision in the Middle East. But in some ways... C has become our scarlet letter. Well, yes, it's the fastest way to get yourself disinvited from (laughs) certain Tony venues, that's for sure. Um, There are also cases I talk about in the book where, uh, in a more serious vein, say the Christianity of a student applying to, uh, I mentioned a couple of cases, Ivy League schools, uh, where the fact of the Christianity is uh, very off-putting to the people reading the application, and I think we, we see more of that. Of course, we see more of it in certain places. Um, a lot of the country isn't like that. But if you want entry into these, if you, if you want to get past some of the most important and influential gatekeepers out there, the letter C is more and more like a scarlet letter or a yellow flag, uh, certainly not something to be considered as a neutral factor in somebody's application. Uh, And that, again, is a very different way of being in America. I want to let people listening in know a little bit about your books. It's Dangerous to Believe, of course, is something that I've been talking about at the Christian Research Institute for a long time. But if you haven't read that book, you're listening in, this is a book to get. It's phenomenal. The subtitle, Religious Freedom and Its Enemies, thinking about some of your other books and How the West Really Lost God. I love some of your titles, Adam and Eve, After the Pill, Home Alone America, 
And these are books that are really worth reading. As a writer myself, I love your turn of phrase. I love your writing style. And I know that people would greatly benefit reading these books and learning to think about what's going on, not only in Western civilization, but around the world. A couple of more ideas, and we'll probably have to call it quits for today. But you've pointed out somewhere that yesterday's sinners have become today's secular saints, that yesterday's sins have become virtues, and that anyone still holding to traditional sexual mores are going to pay the price for holding to those ethics or morals. Cash that out just a little bit. Well, I don't think there's much doubt that things that were once considered sins have been made into virtues. This is what the theology of the sexual revolution is all about. Um, you know, take the example of no-fault divorce from the 70s. Once upon a time, tradition-minded people said, stay together for the sake of the kids. No-fault divorce said exactly what it says, no fault. So, you know, no need to linger here. Um, if your freedom requires that you do something else for your happiness. Um, similarly with abortion, a tradition minded people would think, well, a child is a child and uh, motherhood is an honored calling anyway, but this is not what we're taught by the theology of the sexual revolution, which says essentially, um, Pregnancy interferes with sexual expression, and therefore pregnancy is not a moral issue. It could be made to go away at any time, literally at any time, uh, up until birth. Um, so in one case after another, we see Judeo-Christian moral teaching about sex completely transformed um, in a Nietzschean way, really. I mean, this is what the transvaluation of values is in our time. It is the transformation of traditional uh, teachings, of traditional no's into yeses, if, if you will. Um, so that's where we are, and the question is, what do we do about it? In my work, Hank, as you know, you've been very kind about it. What propels me is the idea that there's a lot of wrong being committed out there in the name of this new theology, uh, and that both believers and, you know, the people arrayed against them need to understand some of the damage out there. I'm sure that in your work you have met people, I know I've met many, who were once on the other side of all these issues and who were brought into the Church or brought into Christian communities or just into a contrarian frame of mind because they really wanted to let go of all that and find a better way of living. Um, I see this on campuses all the time when students come up frequently to talk after a lecture. And very often I hear the words, well, I was brought up believing nothing, but then I met this family and I wanted what they had. You know, it turned out to be like a family of religious believers. So there's a lot of searching out there. And what I'm trying to do is, is shine a light on it um, and shine a light on why the searching is happening, which is the damage that this new secularist faith is doing uh, around the world, yes, but particularly in our society. And we really have to put that front and center, I think. Do you still believe in the power of one? I mean, the fact that one person, a Martin Luther King or uh, uh, Alexander Zolzhenitsyn, a Wilberforce, can change the tide? Oh, of course. I would throw in Whitaker Chambers. If you remember his book, Witness, Witness, the great book about the Cold War struggle, and Chambers, remember, wrote that book thinking that the United States would lose that struggle with communism. And he's very upfront about that in the opening pages and throughout the book. But because of what he did there, in a way that even he couldn't understand, there were people who were brought around by his arguments. And I'm sure that some of them contributed to the ultimate outcome of the Cold War, which was that Chambers was wrong, the United States and the free societies of the West won that struggle, even though one of its chief secular prophets thought it was a losing cause. So 
so that to me is a great example of why we need to keep pushing through even when we can't see uh, what the result of these kinds of intellectual engagements are going to be. Yeah, and I think you've pointed out that we have to keep pushing through for a lot of reasons. I mean, you think about Catholic charities, or you can name many, many other examples, but, you know, here's an organization that's being hampered as a direct result of this new substitute theology that is afoot in the West. Well, it's another example of moral damage, too, because whoever got the idea that it was okay to beat up on other people's charities? You know, whoever got the idea that it was okay to try and sue um, organizations that would put kids into loving homes? When Catholic Charities in Boston was sued out of existence, the other adoption agencies made the point, and I mentioned this in the book, that there go the supply lines. You know, this was an organization that knew more about how to put kids in a loving home than any other. It had had years and years to develop these networks. That's just one consequence, although obviously a really bad consequence of going after people's charities with no regard for the human beings who are on the receiving end of these charities, whether they're kids or poor people or refugees at the border or whoever they might be. Um, The secular, secular activists go after these groups sue them and try to impede them by uh, various administrative orders and in other ways, and that's wrong. I think maybe we ought to end all of this by uh, your wake-up call, whatever you have to say, but I mean, I in some ways feel like you've already said it all, but I think it bears some expansion. You have beautifully written that an insidious new tolerance now snakes its way into classrooms, boardrooms, newsrooms, and other places vital to the exercise of free speech. This new intolerance says we must have diversity in all things, all things except arguments and ideas. It says we must all march in ideological lockstep or feel the snake bite and be taken by ambulance from the public square. Your wake-up call. We do what we do so that we can get to a different place, Hank. And you do it well. And I tell you, I again, this is a great example of your gift with a pen. The pen is mightier than the sword, they say. And if that's true, you have a great role to play in turning around what's happening in modern culture. And Again, I'm one of your fans and really appreciate what you're doing through your writing, through your speaking, and your bravery. I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of bravery. I see a lot of people kind of crawling into the shadows, but you are not. You are speaking out with eloquence and with wit and with reason. And I think as a result of that, you are really making a difference while there's yet time. Thank you, Hank. It's very encouraging to hear you say that of all people. Well, I appreciate you, and we're going to continue talking about your books. Love to have you on the broadcast again in the future, and uh, Godspeed. And same to you. Thanks very much. Talking to Mary Eberstadt, and as I said, she's a, a, really a hero in many ways. I mean, if you read what she's writing, she's bringing to the fore in a very compelling fashion those things that we need to be thinking about as Christians, but really as people in Western civilization as a whole. She has sort of a global perspective. She's not just looking at what's happening in the West, but she has a perspective of what's happening around the world. And, of course, I'm trying to bring these kinds of people to you because these are people that we want to stand behind. These are people that we want to recommend to other people within our sphere of influence. And that's all part of what we're asking people to do with the Hank Unplugged podcast, to rate, to review, to share most of all, to share and let people know about these podcasts so that we can move up the ladder in this particular space, the digital media platform. So please continue standing shoulder to shoulder with Hank Unplugged in the battle for life and truth. We are in the process of harnessing social media, digital media platforms, and we're doing that in a very tangible way. 
We built an incredible studio here in Charlotte, North Carolina, state of the art. But again, the reason is, is we are not standing pat. We're moving into the future with the idea of standing shoulder to shoulder with like-minded people in the battle for life and truth. So again, thanks for joining this Hank Unplugged broadcast. I should say podcast, uh, the broadcast coming up. Uh, later on the day, each day as we do these podcasts as well. So remember, we're trying to use whatever mediums are out there to get the message across, and we're doing it while there's yet time. And so we ask people to stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. So long for now. <laughs>